Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea Tour is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, David Hayes, and Polar Inertia Journal, an outlet for artists and researchers documenting the urban condition at polarinertia.com. So we're sitting here in your studio, the studio you broadcast out of. I assume your broadcaster's instinct kicks in here with the board in front of you, but does the instinct to speak English or Korean kick in first? Uh, well, since I'm talking with you, uh, yes. sorry, the, the English uh, the English comes naturally. Well, I can understand Korean. I'm uh, not great at it. <laughs> no, it comes naturally. But being surrounded, of course, by all my coworkers when I when I come into the studio, I tend to get more into the Korean mode mm -hmm. because people are always like, 안녕하세요, 반갑습니다. 기분 어때요? 오늘 뭐 했습니까? You know, I'm always hearing, you know, just simple greetings and stuff. So mm -hmm. that kind of uh, thing kicks in. But um, it's kind of both, to be honest with you, because we're an English network. But all of our uh, co-workers are Korean, so I tend to go just kind of back and forth, you know, bouncing back and forth. Between. You're in two linguistic mindsets at one time. I try to be. Um, I feel that, <clears throat> excuse me, English is a little bit more dominant, but I'm hoping that one day I'll be able to really comfortably bounce between the two. Mm. And the station, by the way, is EFM 90.5, is it not? That's the name? Yeah, it's right. We're uh, Pusan EFM 90.5, and uh, we're actually funded by the Pusan City Government. Mm. Uh, we've been an active radio station for about five years now. I've been working for four of those five years. And uh, yeah, it's it's amazing that uh, this was actually put together because prior to this, a lot of my broadcasting experience was done through uh, just Korean networks. Mm -hmm. I never had the opportunity to work for an English network. So all of my shows that I did were 100% Korean. Mm -hmm. But getting the opportunity to work here, it actually lets me speak English, yeah. which is, you know, quite easy for me <laughs> speaking that I'm from Canada. Yeah. So uh, I really do enjoy it. But it also lets me still keep in touch with my, you know, um, want to speak Korean. Mm, and it's obviously Busan, Korea, where we're sitting here today on Notebook on Cities and Culture, where I'm speaking with the man who hosts, so I'd say one of the one of the best known figures here on this station, Chad Curtin, better known for his show The Midnight Rider, also known as DJ Chad, also known when he's rapping as Fusion. He's a man of many pursuits. He also teaches English. But the show, The Midnight Rider, it's, I mean, people learn English from it, right? Kids who listen. The, mm. you're, you're teaching when you're teaching, but you're also teaching here, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Um, the Midnight Rider, it's kind of like a cross. Um, I have, a, I would say, an entertaining personality when I rap, uh, when I host uh, television shows and things, uh, when I'm an MC. But uh, also I teach in the classroom. I work as a, a university professor in the English language department at Kyungsung. And um, when I'm in the classroom, I'm kind of in teaching mode. But when I go out and perform, I'm in performing mode. But the really beautiful thing about Midnight Rider is it lets me cross those two together. You know, all of my listeners, of course, of course, want to be entertained. You know, they want to have something exciting to listen to. They want to have a cheerful voice. But at the same time, the people that tune into the Midnight Rider, they tune in because they want to work on their English. I would say the majority of our demographic is Korean listeners. So I tend to cater to that demographic, you know, teaching expressions or, you know, kind of explaining culture points from, you know, English and giving them kind of an understanding of what English is beyond your typical grammar and, you know, right. vocabulary explanations. And, um, yeah, I, I try to mix both of them together. But on my show, I also play a lot of music. I have guests. I do hip hop raps. Uh, you know, I do a lot of different things. But I would have to say my main focus with my show is to entertain my listeners, to have them, you know, feel relaxed after a hard day at work. But at the same time, I, in, in the words of our Arsenio Hall. Give them something that'll make them go, hmm, you know, yes. like they got like, oh, I, okay, you know, this is something I didn't know, you know, something like that. Like Sounds like you're addressing some of the concerns. Like I, I talked to friends of a slightly older, gen older generation, Korean friends, you know, in Los Angeles or here in Korea, and they'll complain that their English education was just not, it wasn't real. It wasn't real English. It wasn't, it wasn't what people were saying, but it also wasn't that useful. You know, they were, they were learning things by, by rote, by memory. And mm -hmm. when they listen to your show, they're hearing people having conversations, right? It's, it's, it's actual English. Oh, exactly. Yeah, we, we teach this with 100% real English. I actually even have a corner that I've uh, in, implemented into my show this season called Don't Trust the Dictionary. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came up with the concept because of the fact that so many Koreans use what's known as Konglish in their everyday speech. Like, they'll use the Korean English Dictionary to translate something, and then it'll come out really strange, but they don't realize that it's strange. Yeah. Um, a good example would be, you know, if... If, um, if you're sick, um, people will say, what was it? Uh, oh, a lot of people, like if not if they're sick, but if they just hurt in general, if they have a pain, uh, you look up in the Korean English dictionary and it translates as sick. 
So a lot of Koreans will say, oh, my arm is sick or my leg is sick or my head is sick. And it just sounds really awkward. And so I've studied um, a lot of these different expressions that I've heard in my life living in Korea. And I've turned it into a corner where I teach, okay, this is not what it means. This is what it means. So, for example, rather than saying, you know, sick, you would say, oh, uh, my, ha- my arm hurts or I have a pain in my arm. But if you're sick, well, obviously, you know, you have a cold. And then I, I make a joke when I teach that one specifically. I say, does your arm sneeze? <laughs> No, it doesn't. So your arm can't get sick. Your arm hurts. And uh, that's been a quite, it's been quite a popular corner now on my show. A lot of Koreans are really enjoying the fact that they're learning what they're saying in, in their culture is correct. But if you use what they thought was English in another culture, for example, America or Canada, it's incorrect. Right. And what's an example of something that doesn't work in Canada that works in America? I wonder if that's, if you have that off the top of your head, because I can't think of anything. <laughs> you know, um, I think something like, I, I just know regular, like vocabulary. Do you know what a toque is? Oh, it's, is that a hat? Is that a kind of hat? There you, there you go. You're it's like a beanie. Oh, okay. A beanie. Do you know what a bunny hug is? I don't know what that is. There you go. A bunny hug is a hoodie. Okay. And I don't know why we call it a bunny hug, because when you pull the hood up, it doesn't look like ears at all. Yeah. But uh, in Canada, it's known as a bunny hug. Is that across Canada? Oh, yeah. You ask across any... Saskatchewan only? I'm pretty <laughs> sure. If you ask any, any Canadian, they will definitely say it could be basically... It could be a Saskatchewan word, but I'm pretty sure bunny hug is all across Canada. Now, you and I both know from studying Korean that it works both ways. The dictionary lies when we're studying, too. You know better than I do. You've been here 10 years. You've had many moments of realizing the dictionary was lying to you in a sense when you're looking up things in Korean. Sure, definitely. Yeah, I've experienced um, a lot of uh, um, misunderstandings and, and things. And uh, when I do have that happen, I just kind of, I don't get upset with myself. And that's one thing that I try to explain to my students is in Korean culture, everybody, well, they, they want to be perfect. You know, there's that whole, like, they just, they just want to get it right the first time and never make a mistake. And um, I try to tell them, you know, when you're learning a language, the more you make mistakes, the better that you're going to get. And I've had, you know, uh, countless experiences, some fun, some uncomfortable, some strange, where, uh, you know, I said the wrong thing or I didn't get it right. And um, yeah, it happens all the time. As long as you accept it going in, yeah. you're good. It's sometimes, you know, especially in East Asia, Japanese and Korean friends, they don't want to say it if they don't think they're going to be perfect, if they don't think, you know, I'll, I'll say it as soon as I know it exactly, yeah. but that moment doesn't come unless you make a mistake first. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't come. And the thing, too, like from my experience, I've worked in a variety of television shows in Korea using Korean. And uh, the thing is, when you're working with someone who's from a different country, You don't have to be perfect. And and this is one thing that I wish a lot of Korean listeners would understand, that just the effort to communicate means more to the person listening than how perfect it comes out. Because obviously we look different from one another. It's an obvious fact that we're foreigners to each other. So as long as you can communicate and, and get what you need to say out, it's gonna, it's gonna work because you'll find an answer. And even when you make your mistakes, the humor in the mistakes can actually help you build relationships. It can, it can make you build bonds. And even in my television shows, when I make mistakes, they like that. They, they're, they're not making fun of me or mocking me, but it's just they're, they're showing that, okay, this guy's really trying to, to communicate. And, right. um, yeah, it's a good thing to make a mistake. Someone, a Korean friend back in Los Angeles who was just there to study, as many of my friends that I make there are who are Korean, they're just passing through for a year or two she was saying it so we you know some language exchange she really liked how i she pointed out that she liked how i was constantly saying ah like you know it's like the you know cartoon french guy so always saying how you say it. but i really i'm really trying to think to myself how do you say this or asking how do you say it but she just liked that i was that i had a, a clear desire to know how to say the thing which sounds kind of strange when i put it that way but it's i it shows you that maybe koreans don't always admit when they don't know exactly how to say it oh, or don't always ask absolutely myself included you know like um i'll i'll be on a television show or you know with a bunch of koreans and we're talking and they'll be saying something and i'll be like trying to understand it you know pulling vocabulary or looking for the you know the grammar conjugations to figure out the tense and everything and i really don't know exactly what's going on but sometimes it's almost like you know your pride gets in the way and you don't want to admit that you don't know and you just kind of like say oh yeah oh okay oh good <laughs> oh <laughs> You know, kind of a thing. What am I agreeing to? Yeah, so in that aspect, yeah, I've had that happen plenty of times. Yeah. But when I look back on it, if I would have just 
asked what was going on, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I would have learned something or, you know, I would have figured out, oh, this is the situation. And I've had plenty of experiences where I, I acted like I knew what was going on when I didn't. And it, you know, got me not in trouble, but it made it uncomfortable because you, you were thinking one way where the conversation was going in a completely other direction. Right. Now, about the television you do, I mean, I've, I've seen at least one show you've, w one of the series you've been on, uh, is it mm. Tong Tong Tong? Yeah, Tong Tong Tong. What's the story there? I, I've watched a, I've watched a few episodes, with uh, your halves of the episodes anyway, yeah, yeah, to yeah. see you exploring Busan, because A, I learned about Busan through it, mm -hmm. and, you know, some very cool uh, Shijang around here, <laughs> learned from your show, yeah, yeah. but... Uh, I've also, you know, it's it's a way for me to study Korean myself as well. So what's the what is the premise? You go on missions in Busan, you try to find things, talk to people. Yeah, the the premise of Tong Tong Tong, uh, my name in Tong 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 is Babinen uh, Golmok Bap Tong Ched, and Babinen Golmok Bap Tong basically means like the hidden food in the back alleys. Right. So you know that's a, a horrible direct translation, but what it means is you kind of go into like the the unique crevices or the special places in Busan, and you find like the delicious meals and the tasty morsels and, and those kinds of things. So the concept of it is where we go to places where most people don't go. And um, it's mostly surrounded around food. Mm. I'll go on missions and experience parts of Busan that maybe um, Koreans haven't been to or would be a good place for them to go. And then I also teach them, if you go to this area, this is a really delicious new dish that you probably would like to try that maybe you haven't tried. What are some of these dishes that have really that you've really found it a good time to go find, to go try on camera to, uh, you know, what dishes have you really added to your repertoire of favorites from this uh, show? You know, I got a really weird one that I don't know how many people will enjoy personally, but uh, I really like the eel. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's called gumjango, which mm -hmm. translates as bear eel. Mm -hmm. And it's a really interesting eel. And um, when you eat it, supposedly according to oriental medicine this eel will give you just amazing energy and stamina it could be in the work way or in the other way sure. um and i <laughs> ate that and it was really really good like i had energy for like two or three days you what know they, how do they prepare it that's the that's the thing that makes people a little bit awkward. Oh, they don't they just it? No, no 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 you don't they don't just put it on your plate yeah. and you eat it no the way they prepare it is actually a little bit um how can i say it's a little bit cruel Gosh. um they take them and uh they basically burn them alive ah, right see. and so uh, in that aspect the preparation method isn't really something that's fun to talk about right. but um they Not are the worst thing you'll see at a fish market around oh, here though. no no i've seen plenty of <laughs> yes. worse you know oh, that that. this morning yeah exactly but it's it's really good i really i really enjoy that one it's 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 quite a delicious dish mm. Mm -hmm. Now, the, this idea of exploring busan it's interesting because i think koreans who are not from busan they they know Busan is a city. They know it's a big city even, mm -hmm. but it's so far from Seoul that it's not in their consciousness as a big place with all kinds of areas that they may never get to see if they don't try hard. I mean, mm -hmm. Busan, North Americans, Americans and Canadians, Mexicans as well, the world North Americans would consider Busan a big city and a pretty exciting city. If you dropped it down into North America, right. it'd be one of the most beloved cities in the country probably. Sure. But Koreans... They forget that it's here sometimes, it seems like. Yeah, there's 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 an interesting fact like when it comes to that. Um I've experienced this myself when I speak. Um I don't speak Korean fluently, but when I do speak Korean, I tend to have a little bit of a Pusan accent, oh, yes. uh the dialect. So when I go to Seoul and I get into a taxi and I ask uh, the taxi driver to take me somewhere, uh, he's like, Oh, Odiga, oh, you chokuro come nico. Oh, you chokuro ka juzeo. Oh, good. And and you chokuro ka ja yogita yogita ega iko you chokuro like like things like that. And he'll be like, Oh, he said he's, 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 Busan is awesome. I was like, oh yeah, Busan is awesome, you know. And then when they learn that I'm from Busan, it's almost like they get this just they they switch. And in Korea, some people feel that people from Busan are are kind of like the country people yeah. of Korea. So in that aspect, you know, they don't really go visit Busan. They don't realize that Busan is an amazing place with so many wonderful things to see. And they 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 think that Seoul is just the main hub. You know, that's where everything happens is in Seoul. But there's so many other beautiful places in Korea that mm. that you can enjoy and experience and I just think that Busan is one of those places. Right. And um I think that just general Koreans who live in Seoul kind of think, well, Busan's the countryside, you know. Right. It's not it's not a real city, you know. There's not real things happening in Busan. There's only th four million people. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, um, I, that's just the I think the general thought. Like, I'm sure there's plenty of Koreans from Seoul that love Busan, but whenever I've talked to someone who's from Seoul, they're always like, "Oh yeah, Busan's nice, but I never go." And mm. I'm like, "Well, why?" And they're like, "Oh, you know, kind of the countryside. <laughs> and there's really not much to do there." Do they say she 
시골? 아 시골 같아요. Yeah, I've heard like I was like, oh, 왜 부산인가요? 어, 사실은 난 부산 좋은데 좀 시골 같아요. Oh. 좀 크지 않아요. 바쁘지 않아요. I mean, 지방 is bad enough. But... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so like um, when I tell people I'm from Busan, they kind of tease me like, oh, you're from the country. And I'm like, yeah. no, I'm not. I'm from a big city. It seems like though, well, you, back in Los Angeles, I got the second satellite dish installed so I could get Korean channels on television to listen and practice. And mostly I watch travel programs on ABS. It seems like Korean television has kind of a thing for travel shows, though, don't mm. they? Like going around, whether it's Seoul, whether it's... Usually it isn't Seoul. Usually it's other cities out in the Jibang or Shigol or whatever you want to call it. Like it's islands Koreans may never go to in their lifetimes, or it's just places that they don't... You know, Maybe Koreans may not travel... Throughout their country, a lot, especially if they're from Seoul, but they seem to like to watch it on TV. Oh, they do. They like to. I think a lot of Koreans like to live vicariously through mm-hmm. stories. Um, that, that's why whenever you watch uh, a television show, there's always a real deep storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, even gag concert shows, like uh, if you watch comedy shows, they've always got like really interesting storylines and and almost educational points. Anything you watch. Um, if you're not teaching something through your show, you're not making a good show in Korea. Right. And I've experienced this in my radio show as well. In the beginning, I always wanted to entertain. And my, my uh, executive producer was like, no, you've got to teach something. Mm-hmm. And I never really understood why. And it's just Koreans have a constant yearning for education. They always want to be taught something or shown something that they don't know. And the general, you know, blue collar working Korean has to put in an atrocious day at work. They work sometimes between 10 to 12 to 14, sometimes 16 hours a day. So they don't even have the time in their schedule if they wanted to, Mm -hmm. to get out and travel and see their own country. So I I think because of that fact, they enjoy watching television shows that take them places that they probably could never go to. Mm -hmm. And because it's the general Korean, like I'm learning this now with my jobs that I take. Um, I'm starting to live a life like a Korean. I work on average of, you know, 10 to 14, sometimes 16 hours a day. And when I talk with my Korean friends about my workday, they don't seem to sympathize. because it's just like yeah that's life that's what we do but when i talk to my foreign friends you know my friends who work in hogwans or universities or who are teaching english in korea they tell me you're crazy you know why do you work so many hours in a day why work eight hours a week yeah exactly so i think to answer your question just the regular korean work such a difficult schedule that they just don't have time to travel it's not that they don't want to i just feel that they just can't because they're they're of their schedules how many individual pursuits go into those 16 hours you're working per day? Me, uh, technically, I've, I hold five jobs. Yeah, I work uh, my main job at the radio station, um, my second main job at my university. Um, I work part-time at an English institute. Um, I work uh, part-time for the Tong 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 television show. And uh, I work part-time for a weekend institute. And actually, that was the five. And now I just picked up a show for the summer vacation period, working through uh, Pusan NBC. And we're going to be traveling around Pusan, going to various beaches, experiencing water sports, and kind of like uh, we talked about earlier, showing a part of Pusan that maybe many mm-hmm. Pusanites haven't seen. So I've got six jobs at the moment. <sighs> now, tell me, when was your first broadcasting experience here in Busan? Ah, my first, my very, very first broadcasting experience was when I first came to Korea. Mm. Um, I came to Korea back in 2000, and uh, I was studying Taekwondo in a city called Pohang. Mm. And um, when I was uh, studying Taekwondo, I think in the whole city of Pohang, there was probably maybe a hundred foreigners at best. I'm surprised they were that many. Yeah, well, maybe. I don't know. It was it was quite a long time ago. And my uh, my grandmaster really loved my enthusiasm for studying Taekwondo. So he called a television crew in to do a documentary about my Taekwondo life. And they compared me to this Taekwondo celebrity from Italy whose name was Bruno. And he was kind of like the main man. And they wanted us to actually fight in a, in a in a kyorugi or in a sparring contest but unfortunately he said no but uh, that was my first experience and um, after that um, he my my grandmaster introduced me to the NBC station and I did a couple of shows for them as a foreigner mm. and uh, that was the beginning of my broadcasting career and what do you think they saw in you as a as a broadcastable foreigner? You know, that, that's a tough question. I think sometimes I was just lucky because I was a foreigner in, in, in a Korean land. You know, I was the, I was the odd man out. So they just wanted to work with me. But, um, I always had a passion for broadcasting even when I was young. Um, I've said this on my show. I actually dreamed of working in television and radio, but when I was young, I had huge stage fright. I was just so scared. I, I wanted to be in the drama team. I wanted to sing in the choir. I wanted to do, you know, different performances and, you know, be like the class 
class president, that public figure in my in my school. But I just never had the confidence to take a shot at it. Mm -hmm. And when I came to Korea, it was like all of my inhibition was just thrown to the wind. You know, I'm a foreigner here. If I make a mistake, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't scared to screw up. Mm -hmm. And I just took a shot at everything that they let me do. And my personality came out and my high energy and enthusiasm. And I, th I think they enjoyed that. Korea seems to do that for some Westerners, doesn't it? It, it lets them be things when they wouldn't have been at home, maybe. Right, exactly. Yeah, because I, I had the dream to be a broadcaster when I was young, but I have a feeling that I never would have done it. But, you know, Korea helped me find that dream. You know, I always say sometimes on my show that um, you don't sometimes find your dreams, your dreams will find you. Mm. And that's what happened exactly in Korea. My, mm. my dreams found me here. Would have been harder to be a broadcaster back in Saskatchewan. Though. Oh, absolutely. Yes. But now that I've been a broadcaster in Korea for going on like eight years, um, I'm actually writing letters and making calls to Canadian broadcasting firms saying, listen, you know, this is my portfolio. I have almost 10 years experience in, in Korea. Would you even consider me mm. to work at your radio station because sometimes in broadcasting it's not necessarily the education but the experience right. so you know i'm maybe hoping in the future to do a crossover but mm. it's hard so mm. uh, it takes it takes a lot of work and a lot of uh, a lot of, of um, kind of groundwork you gotta right. really pave out there and, and find you know the, the right people but and you have a bit of a specialty too because you're doing a bilingual show here you're speaking korean on the air as well you're speaking korean on the on the tv shows you do i mean unlike unlike some Westerners in media, you're working in both languages. I mean, how did that, how did you get to be, how did you get to do that? How did you get to, how'd that get to be your interest? Well, what happened when I first hosted my very, very first radio show back in 2003, uh, the show was called Anyungashunika PSB Nida on a local radio station here in Busan. And, uh, basically they wanted to teach English, but nobody on the, nobody on the staff could speak English quite well except for my co-host. And so everything was done in Korean and they wanted me to interact and talk on the radio and I had to memorize Korean lines for this. So it taught me Korean, basically. I learned a lot of my Korean through broadcasting, mm -hmm. but I always had to bounce back and forth. You know, I'd have to, I'd have to say my memorized line, which most of the time I had no idea what I was saying, <laughs> and then I'd have to speak English. Mm -hmm. And so I always was so envious of my co-host because she had the ability to, you know, just naturally go back and forth, speak to our producer and tell me what was going on and speak to the engineer and tell me what was going on. So I took a real interest in that and I wanted to be someone who could do that. Mm -hmm. and and on the radio show, there was an evening show called M Plus, where a host named Kim Won Bum hosted a teen, he hosted a teenage show in solid Korean. Mm. And I thought, I envied him. I was like, wow, I really wish I could do that. Cause he, he was running the console and he was hosting and producing. It was like a one man show. And I was in my early twenties when I saw him and I was like, wow, I wish I could do something like that. Mm. And it was just really amazing how, like I said, that dream found me and I was given this job. And now I'm trying to do all of that. Mm. So what does it take to do all these tasks at once on the Midnight Rider? Uh, <laughs> well, it, it, it takes it takes a lot. Um, you what have was to... the first episode like? I guess I'll put it that way. Uh, the first episode was quite, uh, it was, I was quite nerve wracking because I hadn't hosted, I went on, I went on a, a hiatus for about three years from radio after my first show. And then got hired on as the Midnight Rider. And <laughs> the very, very first day, they put me in front of the engineering console. And nobody had ever engineered their own show at BEFM before me. And so all the engineers, the entire engineering team came and they were sitting on the opposite side of the glass. I had my producer at the time because I hadn't been given production rights. My writer, my executive producer, and the head of the network were all sitting on the opposite side of the glass and they were just looking at me, waiting for me to throw the first lever to start my show. And there was an immaculate... Stern Korean faces. Yes, yes. There was an immaculate amount of pressure and I thought to myself... You've done this before. You can do it. Just go. And I, I, I did it. And after about the first 15 or 20 minutes, people just started to pan off and fade away. And they were like, yeah, he's got it. He can do it. But the, the countdown from five, four, three, two, one, and it goes, Dum! at that moment my heart was just like racing i was so nervous um but um yeah it, it went okay i was just scared of of not doing it and then they wouldn't have trusted me 
what's what happens in an average midnight rider show? Is there an average? What what's uh, what's your game plan for these shows? Uh, well, every day is a little bit different. We have different segments and whatnot. But uh, the average game plan for the midnight rider show is to have uh, a really nice opening. I like to have a theme show. Like usually, my opening will be thematic to my show. So depending, like if it's a really bad day, if it's the rain, if it's raining, I'll do like a rainy opening. Talk about the weather. Uh, play a song. Come in, and uh, we'll do a new segment where I'll teach. Um, where I'll where I'll read a small news article and then talk about it in more simplified English, teach a couple of expressions, translate those into Korean, and then we'll play another song. Um, I'll come back and we have a quiz corner, which is really, really fun. And uh, I call it How Good Is Your English? And every day is a, a different theme. I think we've got like grammar, vocabulary, sentences, expressions, and then random questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll host uh, that and we'll um, have the listeners uh, communicate and interact through uh, uh, text messages. And that's one thing that I really like about the Midnight Rider is we really try to interact with our listeners through the text messaging service. And so people will text and we can communicate and we'll do that. And then from the 10.30 to the 11 o'clock mark, every day of the week is different. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll have a guest. Um, I have a segment that's really fun called Winner, Winner, Chicken Dinner. And I did take the title from 21. I hope they don't uh, want rights on that. And uh, so what I do is I host a, a quiz. Uh, four people call in and they compete. And the winner gets chicken. But the really cool thing about the chicken is I pay for it myself and I deliver it to their house the day they win. I don't on that motorcycle we came on. I don't personally <laughs> deliver it, but they get to pick the chicken restaurant sure. that they like. And uh the really cool thing is when most people win things on the radio, they've got to wait, you know, a week for the coupon to come in the mail and it's you know, they the whole winning feeling has left them by the right. time the coupon comes in the mail. Right. But we give them the chicken the within thirty minutes of them winning it. The guy shows up there. Yes, yes. to their house. And um my writer, Im Soo Jin, is an amazing woman. She actually found out a way that we could make this happen because mm -hmm. no radio station in South Korea delivers the prize to the door at the minute they win it. And so uh, we do that. And then after the 11 o'clock hour, from 11 o'clock until 11.03, I have a freestyle corner where I freestyle every day. Mm -hmm. And I've been on the air for about four years, and I freestyled almost every day for those four years. And uh, we do the freestyle hip-hop corner. I come back with the weather. Um, then we have our Don't Trust the Dictionary. Mm -hmm. And then we go into requests. We have people call in uh, pound nine zero five zero on the request um, for the requests on the message board. And then from 11.30 till 12 o'clock, again, it's a different segment every week. Sometimes we have interviews. Um, I have a segment called Inspirations where I'll tell a story from someone who's very inspiring or do an interview with someone who's done something really amazing. We've had people from the UN on the show. We've had Korean stars, movie stars, singers, actors, uh, people who work in education, um, private businessmen, entrepreneurs, all of those kind of people come in. And um, that's basically um, kind of a... A small summary, if that was small, of what we do on the Midnight Rider. What have you learned about your listeners with all that interaction you get through texts, through people who win contests, mm -hmm. through any kind of feedback? What have you learned about who's listening? Because at the beginning, you didn't know anything. It was a new show. So, what have you found out? Uh, we have a we have a variety. Uh, we have a wide listening audience. Mm -hmm. um, the Midnight Rider, if you ever look it up on the internet, claims to be a show that's for young listeners. You know, uh, middle school, high school, university, and young adult. Mm -hmm. But it's quite the opposite. Um, we have a variety of listeners who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s. I even had a man who was like 65 calling once and said that he really enjoyed the show because it helped him work on his real English. Like right. he really felt that he could understand things. Uh, because when I'm on the show, I don't use a lot of really large vocabulary um, unless it's in the news segments. I try to speak clearly um, exactly and, and have them understand me and doing that actually has taken my English and sometimes I forget things you know living in Korea for such a long time you tend to forget a lot of your English but I want to make it at like a, an intermediate level where you know someone who has a, a grasp of English who studied English in school can listen to this show and hear things that they've studied mm -hmm. and through that process you know start developing their English and maybe have the courage to speak and continue on with their, their English studies. So I was going to say with the, the young listener demographic, it's difficult to get them because not because they're not listening, but because they are in Hagwon yeah. uh, until like sometimes until midnight. Right. Right. And that's why our show is slotted from 10 o'clock until midnight, mm -hmm. because a lot of um, a lot of high school students will finish their studies at around mid at around 10 yeah. or 11. And some of them who are even in the Hogwans from, you know, 11 till midnight are are studying in the study room and they'll be listening to my show while they're studying and I heard tteokbokki yeah, yeah, yeah with their tteokbokki and I remember one time I was doing a quiz corner and this kid actually called me from his classroom and he was whispering into the telephone and I was like you have to speak up he's like I can't talk louder I'm like why he's like my teacher will hear 
call me. And then I'm like, well, stop and get off the phone or go to the bathroom. And yeah. he actually called a bathroom break and went That's to the bathroom funny. and and had the quiz and he won it, I think. That was pretty fun. That's dedication. Yeah, yeah. Did you begin rapping in Canada or did you start that here? Um, I loved hip hop when I was in Canada and it was something that I practiced. Like I'd write lyrics and I'd try to work on my freestyle. Uh, but like I said in the beginning, I had huge stage fright. I, you know, I come, I came from a single parent family and my mom worked 12 hours a day as a telephone solicitor and I really didn't have a lot of time to talk to my mom. Uh, my father wasn't there, so I pretty much spent a lot of time to myself, mm -hmm. uh, which made me quite quiet. You know, I never really had anyone there to say, Hey, go try this. Or, you can do this. You know, give that a shot. So everything that I wanted to do, I was quite scared. Mm -hmm. um, but I met a really good friend whose name is Gord Cohen. He lives in Canada. And he introduced me to hip-hop music in grade 11. And uh, he was a painter. Uh, he was three years older than me, and he painted in our apartment complex and loved hip-hop. And he introduced it to me, and I just fell in love with the genre. And so I'd write my own lyrics and everything. But again, I was just too scared to take a shot and perform in front of somebody. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I got my first radio gig in Korea, I hosted a different show as a part-time job on Saturdays. And they said to me, um, you know, let's make this really fun and exciting. And they played a hip-hop song during the song break. And I said, oh, wait a minute. I said, bring the music down and open up my mic. And they said, what are you going to do? I said, just just do it. I got an idea. I got an idea. And so they brought the music level down and opened up my mic. And I just freestyled over the track. And listeners wrote in. They were like, oh, that was really fun. That was really exciting. And from that day forward, every Saturday when I got to work on that show, I would freestyle. Mm -hmm. And people just really enjoyed it. And that was the beginning of, of my hip-hop career. When did you begin working Korean into it? Um, as soon as I could speak it, you know, like, cause whenever I was, it's a way to learn. Yeah, exactly. It's, a, it's an amazing way to learn. And, uh, as soon as I could, sp as soon as I could speak it, I gave it a shot because when you rap, if you're rapping to an audience that doesn't understand your language, if it's just sounds, unless you've got really good rhythm or, you know, syllable combinations, it might be entertaining, but you're not really going to get the message. And so I started writing raps in Korean to try to implement those into, uh, into my repertoire. And then I, I did a show one day. It was a, a show outside of, uh, Kyungsung and I, I did a Korean rap and it wasn't that good, but the crowd just loved it. And so I started, you know, trying to rap in Korean and, in, make that a part of my performance. It's a fair bit easier to literally rhyme in Korean, isn't it? I mean, you, you've got you've got a lot of the same endings in these sentences. Yeah, yes and no. Like if you're, you're not always ending it. Yeah, every no line is not the doesn't end. count. Like that, that's 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 a misconception. Everything cannot end in yo, yeah. which actually makes Korean a lot harder to yeah. rhyme in. But the thing is when you find the syllable combinations that work together, Korea has an amazing flow. Like mm. a really good Korean rapper, they just they sound so perfect. Mm. You know, they they there's no mistakes in their pronunciation or intonation and all of the syllables just seem to meld together and it's mm. a really wonderful thing that is kind of the ultimate test of speaking a language if you can rap in it if you can freestyle in it yeah. then you know you've you know you've made progress i mean when did you start to feel comfortable doing an extended freestyle in just korean uh well i'm still working on that you know like i do freestyle in korean a bit now and i i do throw that into it but uh, that's the hardest thing you know that's just like when i'm on my show and i'm i'm ad-libbing or interviewing somebody in korean if you can go and have an ad-libbed conversation in korean that shows that you're really getting a grasp of the language so uh, i i'm starting to be quite confident in it but but uh, I'm still working with uh, my Korean friends and, and developing that part of my skill. So other than rapping, what are the ways, having been here 10 years, that you're still, in a sense, studying Korean? That you're, the, the ways you still find, like, I guess the lifestyle choices you make so you can still improve Korean. Because people can flatline pretty easy. Mm. They can plateau. Uh, if they just have their routine mm -hmm. and most of their work is in English, they stop learning. So how do you keep learning? Well, I just, it's, it's part of my personality. Um, I'm one of those people that just doesn't want to give up. Mm -hmm. um, I remember my first year in Pohang, things were really hard. I lived in a place that was um, above a raw river of sewage. Oh. A raw river, it was a whole, oh. like, and it would smell the house up in the summer. In the winter time, it was so old and rickety, all of the pipes froze. And I had to sleep on a heated mat for my entire winter and a bath in a public bathhouse. We used a bucket in the bathroom because we had no running water. But many of our, many of my coworkers quit, but I was so determined to make it to the end because I wanted that one month severance that you get when you finish your year contract. So I put up with all of that for one extra paycheck. But that's the way that I am. You know, I'm really determined. And when I, when I set a goal, I just want to accomplish it. And living in Korea, there's so many times where I'll be in a room and listening to a conversation or watching television or being 
listening on the radio and I'll get a text message and I just don't understand what they're saying. Mm-hmm. And it, it drives me to want to learn more. Right. Um, it's the not understanding that's yeah, like, oh, yeah. now I've got to study even harder. Right. And also just, you know, communicating with my friends. Like I've got like some really close Korean friends and there's so much that I want to say to them. And I feel that if I could communicate in their own language, they would really feel what I want to express because you lose that feeling factor when things get translated. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I just want them to really like, mm-hmm. like if they can really feel what's in my heart and what I want to say, you know, and that also drives me to speak Korean. Because it's pretty important with Koreans themselves talking to each other. I mean, so much of it is they're sort of feeling each other's feelings, right? And you wonder, how are you doing that? I can't do that in English when I'm talking to a friend in English. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, Koreans are quite passionate. You know, they have, they have, they, they, they're really passionate in everything that they do. And yeah, that, that is one thing that I really would like to get a hold of. It's mm-hmm. tough. It is tough. Now here in here in Busan, I mean, you mentioned the, the, there's the there's the uh, dialect, the Satori that you. Mm. I mean, because you you've been here so long, that was that never a challenge to understand specifically apart from Korean? Mm. Like the Satori itself, was that ever a challenge? Oh, it's it's a huge challenge. Mm. It's a never ending struggle. I, I would I would call it a struggle because Satori is so different because it's everything has a new word. Mm. Uh, for example, the word many, you could say mani or like ajumani or something like that. But in Korean, they say oksuro. Oh, here, here in Busan, they Busan. say that. In yeah. Busan, they say oksuro. Uh, or um, you could say like, um, there's another expression, you could say nomumari, and they say chanjibekari. Mm-hmm. And chanjibekari translates to as many clouds as there are in the sky. Mm-hmm. So you could directly translate that to as a dime a dozen in English. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a di- there's like English teachers in Busan are a dime a dozen. Yoga kangs are all chinji Busan is a chanji bekari ita. You know, like there's so many of us in that aspect. So there's always different words for everything. It's almost like learning a completely new language. The intonation of the dialect is so different and the ending conjugations are also different. Right. So it's, it is a struggle. You know, like I, I'm learning, like even when I speak in Pyojuna, like in regular, uh, speech, I sometimes tend to throw the, the dialect accent into it. Mm-hmm. And that's when people meet me and they say, Oh, you live in Busan. On, don't you? Uh, like, yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. I'm from Busan. So this, the fact that English teachers are, by the way, a dime a dozen, is that what is that the excuse they gave you in Pohang for putting you in that dilapidated house with no plumbing? That's a good question. I think the, you know, the reason that they put us in there is, you know, it's it's a business, and there's someone at the end of the line that's making a paycheck, mm-hmm. and they just wanted to make more money. Mm-hmm. You know, nowadays, like I remember, I I worked that job for two years. And then after I left, there were more foreigners that were coming into the city and something happened and that they were all taken out of that place and put into an apartment. Yeah. So I think we were in the, the middle stage. You know, they didn't have enough money to get an apartment. So they just put us in there right. to let the time pass. But nowadays living in Korea, if you ever have any problem with the living conditions, there's so many people you can call, you can go to the law. Um, it's they people nowadays treat you very well. You're, the standard of living here is very high compared to when I first came to Korea. Mm-hmm. But I was I was one of the guinea pigs, you know, like when I from when I came to Korea, there was not many of us. Right. So, you know, you had to go through that. And because of that, so many of us left. So many of my my coworkers like I can't live in this place. And they just they they do a midnight run mm. and, and they would leave. But like I said, I was just too stubborn. Yeah. I wanted that last paycheck. <laughs> What'd you spend it on? I, I can't remember. I think I said at home. I, I had a lot of student loans at the time. It probably went on my student loan. And that's another good thing with Korea. They they helped me pay off my student loan. Oh, yeah. You know, they got me debt free and the lifestyle was cheap and I didn't spend a lot of money and I could send a lot of money home and um that really, really helped me out. So when did you discover Busan? Um how I discovered Busan was quite interesting. Um I I'd been living in Korea for a year and uh one of my friends were like, Let's take a trip to Busan. And let's just look around. And the thing was, living in Poang, <laughs> there was really nothing foreign in Poang. We had one McDonald's, and that was it. <laughs> there was no foreign food. There was there was no Costco. There was no no place to go shopping for foreign food. Everything was Korean. And so we took a trip to Pusan. We took the bus. Uh, this is, they didn't have the KTX back then. And uh, we 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 landed in Samyon, and they had a TGI. Oh, a TGIF. Yes. And I went there and I ordered a hamburger with bacon and cheese and I ate a cheesecake for dessert and I fell in love. I was like, I've got to move to this place. Yeah. So it was actually the food and the foreign culture that made me come here. But another strange thing about it was when I got off of the bus and I looked around Pusan, it didn't feel foreign to me. Like I was, it almost, I almost had a feeling like, this is where I have got to live. Mm. And I, I wanted to live here and I, I felt a connection to it. And yeah. Do you, do you, 
Have you thought about what that was? What were, what you were connecting to? I don't know. Like it's it's really strange. Like this is just this is really way out in left field. <laughs> but uh, a lot of my Korean friends, um, and I even went to like a into to like a soothsayer or like one of those uh, ancient um, what are they called? The people who tell your future. Oh, the fortune tellers. The fortune the, tellers. Were they the ones? One of the ones set up by the Pojang Matcha, or uh, more legitimate. like that, yeah, <laughs> something like that. And I went to one of those places because um, one of my friends said it would really be fun. And I don't know whether to believe this or not. It's really out in left field. But the guy told me that I was Korean in a former life. Wow. And I don't know if he did that to, you know, make a buck or whatever. But when I came to Pusan, everything just felt really comfortable. And I'm not saying that I was a reincarnated Korean or anything. <laughs> but uh, things just felt really nice and comfortable. And I felt like it was home. So I wanted to, I wanted to live here. Did you know any Korean people at all back in Canada? No, nothing. No. Um, nothing. When I was growing up in school, um, for those who see me personally, um, I'm very thin. I'm a skinny guy. And when I was growing up in school, of course, I was very, very skinny. I didn't wear shorts until high school. I, I just hated my legs. And all of my friends were Asian because they were like the same size as me. And I got along with them so well. And I had a lot of Filipino friends when I was in elementary school and a lot of Chinese friends, but I knew nothing about Korea. I had no Korean friends. And what brought me here was I heard about the 1988 Olympics in Korea. And if I came here, I could learn Taekwondo. And when I was offered a job in South Korea as an English teacher when I was in university, I thought, wow, I could be a Taekwondo student and learn Taekwondo finally. finally because my mom refused to let me study any martial art because growing up in a single parent family you know I got in a lot of fights because of the fact that I would get teased a lot and my mom would tell me if you learn anything you're just going to use it so I'm not letting you learn any martial art I wasn't even allowed to have a plastic gun my mom oh, hated yeah. violence and so uh, when I was old she said when you're old enough you can learn it and when I came to Korea of course I was in my 20s and I thought yes I can finally study Taekwondo mm -hmm. and so I gave it a shot uh, my mind goes back to that TGI Fridays incident yeah. in Busan because I remember on one episode of Tong Tong Tong, uh, somebody says to you, she knows where to get food from your hometown, and you think they mean Canadian food. Right. It's not Canadian food. It's like a sort of caricature of an American restaurant. Yeah. It looks like an okay steak, though. But what's Canadian food? Can, oh, well, tip like I guess cliche Canadian food would be poutine. Uh, uh, poutine. Is that even in Saskatchewan? Uh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. When, uh, I think of it as a Quebec thing. No, no, no. Poutine. Like uh, I remember, we used to cruise Eighth Street. It's a, it was a cruising spot when I was in high school, and we cruise up and down the street, hanging out, trying to pick up girls or whatever. <laughs> and uh, Burger King had poutine, mm -hmm. and uh, that was my first taste of poutine. Um, uh, Canadian food. Uh, oh goodness, goodness. Saskatoon berries. We can have Saskatoon berry pie. I've always thought it's crab apples to be Canadian, but maybe. Maybe they've got them in America. Um, Canadian food, besides poutine, I think everything is just global. You know, you could you could go cliche and say like pancakes and maple syrup. Sure. Um, pierogies, I think, are a very Canadian food. That's more Ukrainian, but it's like right. Canadian Ukrainians have have brought in a lot of pierogies. It's like American food as immigrant food made American. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were there was a, a lot of people that came in, and uh, yeah, I would say I would say pierogies would be a real Canadian food. Like I, my mom used to make pierogies. We'd hand Handmade pierogies were quite delicious with sour cream and bacon bits. You're making me hungry talking about this, by the way. I haven't had pierogies in like six years. Oh, no. um, yeah, those would be some Canadian foods. Uh, does any place label itself Canadian food here? I know there's a big chain called like Rockies in China that's mm. Canadian fast food. I don't know what they serve, but do do Korean friends here ever ask you to explain things about your homeland? Like ask you what's what do Canada what do how do Canadians do this? How do Canadians do that? Yeah, I get that a lot. And it's really hard to answer the question because, to be honest with you, frankly, Americans and Canadians are the same. You know, like I, I know when I walk down the street and like someone will come up to me and say, oh, you're from America. And I'm like, no, I'm from Canada. And then they instantly get apologetic. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm. Like they're expecting me to get mad at them or something. And it's like, no, I'm Canadian. It's not a big deal. It's like it's like if you called them Japanese, they think that's the same yeah, thing. Yeah, right? exactly. But in my opinion, I think Americans and Canadians, we're, we're all, you know, European from, you know, Anglo-Saxon Europeans that, you know, came in on ships and we all did the same thing with the North American Indians, you know, we're all the same people, we're just on a different part of land, really. And at this point, a decade in Korea, mm. is it a decade in Korea or a decade just Busan? Um, it's a decade in Korea. A decade in Korea, I imagine you feel more of a balance between the Canadian part of your life and the Korean one, like it's, it's not like you've been it's not like you're traveling to Korea, you know, it's, it's, you, you, it's not like you've forgotten Canada either, but at this point, I imagine, you know, notwithstanding the fortune teller telling you you're reincarnated Korean or whatever, that you feel 
almost as much a part of Korea as of Canada. Absolutely, because of the fact I came to Korea when I was in my 20s and now I'm in my 30s. So, you know, a third of my life technically has been spent in this country. So it really does feel like home. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of the of the lifestyle I have adopted to, um, the way that I work, my work ethic, a lot of things that I do now are very Korean. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of have that like bali bali addiction. I want to get <laughs> things done quickly. Um, I multitask and I do so many things at one time that it's, it's very Korean. And um, being in crowds or surrounded by many people does not affect me at all mm-hmm. and um, you know I just that drive to work that drive to get the job done to never stop it's so Korean um, I feel a part of my life is is quite Korean now but at the same time you know I, I talk with my mom daily through you know like FaceTime or you know Skype yeah. or whatever you want to call it and my Canadian personality is still here but I feel like my tag my hip-hop name fusion yeah. things have just blended together and there's parts of me that are Korean and there's parts of me that are Canadian and depending on who I'm with those parts come out or depending on what job I have to do those parts will come out but it's kind of like the way that I hope to be able to speak in Korean one day I can just go from one to the other from one to the other simultaneously and that's kind of my mission and my goal in my Korean life go back and forth so fast nobody can tell which one you're doing at any given moment exactly now have have, uh, Canadian friends visited you here um, friends, yes. I had one friend, his name, uh, Mike Susie. Uh, he actually, he wanted to work in Korea for a little bit, but more of like a work study vacation. Yeah. He came up for about three months and, uh, we lived together in, uh, in my Korean friend's apartment mm-hmm. and, uh, had a really, really good time. Um, uh, my best friend, uh, his name's Terrence Dash. Uh, we actually went to high school together. Mm-hmm. And after my second year in Korea, I went home and I, or my first year in Korea, I went home and I met him at the mall and I told him about my life. Mm-hmm. And he was just so excited about it. And I said, I'll take you, I'll bring you with me. And uh, after going back, I brought him. And uh, he's lived in Korea up until this day. Really? And we still live in Busan together. So wow. my best Canadian friend is living with me currently in Busan. And what's he do here? Uh, he's also a teacher. He's a teacher. And uh, he's with a Korean. And uh, he's just, yeah, he's, we're just living, we're living the Korean life together. <laughs> and it's really great. It's interesting that teaching teaching English is often such a big part of the Korean life for a foreigner because it's, well, an English speaking, a native English speaking foreigner because it's like they have that skill to begin with. And what Koreans need most is native speaker conversation. But the spectrum is so wide. You know, there's guys like you who are doing, you know, you're teaching English on the radio, you're teaching English at the university, you're doing high level stuff. And then there's the experience you had to begin with in the shack with teaching at the Hagwon. I mean, when somebody says, I want to come to Korea to teach English, and you know, they might just be going to a Hagwon on the plane three weeks from that day, you know, whatever. Um, What do you tell them? It's gotten better, as you say, since you did it then. Mm -hmm. But what do you tell... What do you tell guys and girls who want to who want to come here and do that? Well, it all depends what you want out of your life, mm-hmm. to be honest. Like, I can't say, like, this is the road to success because right. everybody has a different road that they want to travel. You know, some people want to come to Korea um, as a way to pay off their student loans. Mm-hmm. And if that's your main goal is just to get that twenty or $30,000 paid off and go back home and continue your life, Korea is a great place. You can make so much money. Mm-hmm. Um Korean uh, English teachers are paid so well compared to what they'd be paid back home. It, I sometimes feel almost like it's a crime the way that they pay us here, uh, but I'm not going to complain about it. <laughs> so if that's your goal, then do that job at that hogwan and, and be that foreigner and deal with you know the culture shock and the problems that will go along with working at that hogwan. Make your money and go back and continue your life. Um, if if you want to be more of a person who who gets something emotionally or who learns something from the experience. Starting from the bottom is the best place. They got that track by Drake, I think it's called Started from the Bottom, Now We Here. You know, like, in order to get somewhere in life, you have got to live in the shack. You have got to deal with, with having no power and, and you have got to deal with the smells and the stinks and, and, and the disgusting parts of being at the bottom because nobody's thrown into the top. So if you do have the endurance and the longevity and the persistence to, to succeed, you will succeed if you try hard in Korea. Um, a really good example a guy named Jesse Day he lives in Seoul he started in Korea just doing small stuff and now he's working in television he's doing commercials Uh, he's got sponsorship the guy has really blown up but he started at the bottom Mm -hmm. but the thing is like 
in Korea, the bottom is not that bad. <laughs> the bottom the is okay. The bottom's better than okay. The yes. bottom is a lot better than the bottom that you're going to start straight out of university. Mm-hmm. You might be working in a Mickey D's or get hired at a job, you know, where you're where you're serving coffee, making you know ten, twelve, fifteen bucks an hour. Mm-hmm. You know, the average salary, you know, hourly for a part time job in Korea as an English teacher is like thirty, forty, fifty dollars. It's ridiculous. It's like plumber money. Mm-hmm. You know, like you make really good money here, and all you have to do is talk. Mm-hmm. So starting at the bottom is not bad but if you really think it is the bottom there's a lot of room to grow right it's, that's almost i don't want to say it's a korean way of thinking but here they really have internalized that sense of you you've got to you've got to work through the entire hierarchy right yeah, absolutely. No skipping. absolutely there is there is no skipping no skipping is allowed and even at my radio station when i got hired at befm uh, they hired me on as a straight dj mm-hmm. and uh, they let me do the engineering because i had that experience um but i had a producer um, I had my executives over me. I had weekly meetings discussing my content, and they would just edit like oh. everything in my show. I, ha- I felt like I had no control. Mm. And then after a year, I- I'd go back to the executives and say, "Listen, you know, I have the ability. Please let me produce." And then they said, after one year, okay, so they said, we'll let you produce, but you can only be a temporary producer. So you technically produce your show, but you have someone who monitors you. Mm. And then that person monitored me for an entire season. And then after that passed, they gave me full production of my show and things have completely changed. But yes, in Korean, there is that hierarchy. There are those steps that you must take in order to get somewhere in mm. your career. And I don't find a problem with that. You know, mm. it's, it's, it seems normal to me. And I think back home in Canada, if I was a graphic designer, I would have to start out at the bottom doing, you know, the really bad work. And then after X amount of years, I would move up and move up and move up. And I just think that's the natural progression of any career. So how important do you think it is to learn to, in a, in a sense, think in the Korean way to, say, speak the language better? You know, I hear people sometimes say, often Koreans who have been in America a while, sometimes I, if I'm speaking in English, I think I have to think like an American about the subject, or Korean, I have to think like a Korean again. Mm. Do you think there is a, a sense in which you need to think Korean as well as to speak it? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. It, like I said in the beginning, it all depends on what your goal in life is and what your job you know, is or what you want to get out of Korea because everybody wants to get something out of something. That's why they, they, they work. <laughs> but um, it, whatever you want to get out of Korea depends on the way that you act. And uh, for, for me and for a lot of foreigners living here that we're really looking at in the long term, you need to understand how to think like a Korean because there are just some things that don't translate. Uh, some parts about work ethic, some parts about, you know, social Socializing, uh, the way you deal in problems. Um, a lot of a lot of foreigners, as an example, will get angry quickly when things don't go their way. You know, if, if there's a culture gap or, or a glitch in the matrix, uh, they tend to just get angry. And getting angry can be a real huge downfall to your career. Um, I knew a foreigner who did a show. It was a television show, and they didn't quite treat him the way that he wanted to be treated. And he got a little bit upset at the producer trying to say, well, this is the way that we do things in Canada or in America, and this is the way we think things should be done. Why can't you do it this way? And they they never called him back. Oh, of course. Of course, you know. So in that aspect, you know, learning to understand the Korean mentality, to communicate like a Korean, to deal with problems like a Korean professionally, is is quite important. I think that the same would go back home in, in Canada. Imagine if you had a Korean working in a Canadian uh, establishment and he just started acting Korean and mm-hmm. getting all upset that things aren't going fast enough or like multitasking and not focusing on one point and creating problems in his work environment. Mm-hmm. He would lose his job. Mm-hmm. The thing, the same thing goes in Korea. You know, when in Rome, you have to do as the Romans. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And when you meet Korean students of English, whether it's through teaching them at the university or through the show... Do you get the sense that a lot of them would really make great strides if they just sort of dropped themselves into an English speaking country for a while? Maybe not, doesn't have to be 10 years, yes. but it can be, you know, do you, do you get that sense that that's often the missing piece is just not having lived the life? Um, you can learn to live the life through media, watching enough television shows and, 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 you know, being a part of, I think the media can be a big, a big education uh, point for any, any Korean, but yeah, you've got a, you've got a strong point, you know, like if I would have just watched a whole bunch of Korean television shows and memorized vocabulary and, you know, talked Korean as much as I could with my other Korean learning friends, it would not have made that my, it would not have built my character. Um, when I went back home to Canada to study my uh, design, I went back home to Medicine Hat for one year. I met a bunch of Koreans that were living in Medicine Hat. Now, Medicine Hat is a quite, it's quite a small city in, right. in Canada. And uh, they seemed to communicate better. They seemed to understand things. They seemed to really feel 
what it was like to be a Canadian. Mm -hmm. And they lived in Canada for three years. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these Koreans that they want to learn English, they want to get a, gris a grasp on the language, and they go there for like six months, mm -hmm. you're wasting your time. Take, right. take your airfare and go to a really prestigious Hagwon and learn English here in Korea, right. or take a vacation with that money. Don't go to Canada and waste six months of your time because you're not going to absorb it. Mm -hmm. You need to spend a year, bare minimum, to two years to a comfortable three years in another country to really get a grasp for the culture because mm -hmm. that's where the language comes in. It's not necessarily the, the technical aspects. It's the culture, learning how to be a person from that country. Mm -hmm. And I would say to anyone listening to this podcast, if you really want to learn English and you really want to take the effort to go to another country, give yourself a two to a three year window mm -hmm. and you will really learn a lot. And, and, and I know you're from Koreatown in, in uh, LA, but stay out of Koreatown. Okay. <laughs> yes, I was going to mention that. Please stay out of Koreatown. You've heard the rumors. Oh, I, I haven't heard the rumors. <laughs> I, in my opinion, that's just, that's just common sense. <laughs> stay out of Koreatown town because you're going to learn nothing you know you know socialize with as many people from that country as you can you know like i'm from saskatoon if you spent three years in my city you would know so much english by the time you left yeah, because no we, don't, choice. we don't even have a korean restaurant in saskatoon <laughs> you might long for kimchi you will long for kimchi but um you know you can always order that i'm sure where do you have to go from saskatoon to find korean food how far in what direction calgary calgary, calgary is about a seven hour drive <laughs> Uh, west. It's a long way for kimchi, but there's there's a Korean presence there. Oh, there is a bit. Yeah, they they have um they they have Korean. There are Koreans in Saskatoon, but most of the restaurants. Maybe they have a Korean restaurant now. It's been quite a few years since mm. I've been home, but um yeah, there's there's a lot of Chinese restaurants mostly, and I think it's just all Chinese. Mm. And the majority is Chinese. I don't think there's anything else but Chinese. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I th I think there was actually one Chinese restaurant run in Saskatoon by a Korean, and I thought that was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> now speaking still in cultural terms. You know, you do the show, you end it, you, you end it late every night. Yeah, sure. And Korean cities are talked about as having a robust 24-hour culture. Is that something you benefit from? You, you work all day into the night. Can you still benefit from whatever 24-hour culture goes on in Busan? Mm, absolutely. 100% yes. Yeah. Um, because I, I'll work like maybe a 14 or a 15-hour day, and um, I'm still going. You know, I want to do something, you know. So after when my radio show finishes at midnight, I'll call Terry, my friend, and I'll say, hey, let's go. I love to screen golf. I love golf, mm -hmm. uh, but golfing in Korea is very expensive. Mm -hmm. So I screen golf. And I said, you want to go screen golfing? And he's like, yeah, sure. So, you know, we'll go to the store and we'll pick up a couple of beers and we'll go to the screen golf, 24 hour screen golf place. Mm -hmm. And we'll tee off at like 1230 and we'll golf till three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And it's completely okay. Mm -hmm. We'll finish golfing and we'll, we'll go downstairs and walk down the street and there are still people in yeah. the the street yes. and it's like Thursday night mm -hmm. and there are still it's not like Saturday it's Thursday night and there are still <laughs> people in the street mm -hmm. so um yes definitely you know I feel that 24-hour culture is, is a real benefit to me because of the fact that I work so late and I don't have a lot of time to enjoy myself I'm constantly working right so um yeah 100 percent well you've got you figured it out so that even your work takes you around the city i mean you're exploring it for example on television you know you've been shooting shows lately what kind of places can we expect to see you explore in the in the future um for now i'm going to be all around busan i'm going to be hitting every beach in busan we got wow. dalepo Heonde, guangali songdo we're going to be hitting all of the beaches in busan um, with Tong Tong Tong, we're actually revamping for next season. Mm. So Tong 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 might actually take me outside of Busan, oh, wow. which uh, I'm really, really excited about. But for the time being with uh, NBC and uh, the show is called Badaya Norja, which mm. means like, let's enjoy the ocean or pl ba Norja basically means play, but I would say like, let's, let's enjoy the ocean or let's, mm. you know, hang out at the ocean. Mm. And uh, that's going to be taking me all around Busan, every beach. And we've got so many wild things that we're doing. I think this Sunday, um, uh, they're going to be hooking me up to water jet Astro Boy boots. Oh, I've seen, I saw ads for those on the Seoul yeah, subway and I was yeah. like, that looks difficult and kind of dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So they're going to be hooking <laughs> me up to those. And last week, actually, um, I got to ride on this like underwater jet pack and, uh, we like, we, we had races down the ocean. Um, uh, I put on this like old, like 20,000 leagues under the sea, like, air helmet and I had a gun that shot air bubbles and we had gunfights under the water. Um, NBC's really, you know, stepping it up and we're going to be doing some really cool stuff. So it's going to be fun. So how similar are, you know, you've got, everybody has to use a slightly different personality for everything they do. And, you know, you've got for television, you've got one for mm. the Midnight Rider, you've got one for teaching, you've got one as a rapper. How, 
How much overlap? Are these all pretty much the same guy? How much variance is there? That's a good question. Um, actually, um, ah, oh, goodness. I, I met someone who was a YouTube vlogger. He goes by the name of Michael, uh, Michael Aronson. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he is also quite well known in the world of YouTube for doing videos talking about Korea. And, uh, I asked him to come to my studio for an interview. And he actually took the KTX2 Busan mm -hmm. and visited me in my studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we did the interview together, after everything was over, um, the interesting thing that he said to me is he said, being interviewed by you and talking to you on the phone, I don't feel like you're a different person. Mm -hmm. He says, you seem like the same guy you are on air as you are off air. And he's like, that's really different for me because I'm quite different on air than I am off air. Oh, he thought he was different. Yeah, yeah. So my personality is pretty much the same all around. I, I'm mm -hmm. kind of developing my myself as a broadcaster and as a, as a media personality. And I'm using that personality just as myself. And um, I think that everything is pretty much the same. The only thing that would be hard about it is... Doing hip hop music, it's kind of a different genre. There's a different face that's involved in that. And so developing my personality as a hip hop MC is, is different from my broadcasting personality. And that's the only kind of glitch that I would say that I have in all of the things that I do. Mm -hmm. But my regular life, my television, my radio, my teaching, my personal life with all of my friends, I'm pretty much the same guy, I think. Mm. Just a little bit more animated <laughs> when I'm on the radio and on television. Sure, sure. But I uh, am. Yeah. And finally, I don't know how clean you you work when you're doing a live hip hop show, mm -hmm. but how hard is it to not say any forbidden words while freestyling on the air? It's tough. Um, uh, in the beginning, it was actually really tough, and now now that I've done it for for, for quite some time. Um, I'm, I'm learning that, that there's, there's this side and then there's the other side. Right. So when I rap on the radio, I, I tend to keep my lyrics more kind of comical and it's even, like, I even have a segment where I'll teach hip hop with, with, or I'll teach English with hip hop. <laughs> like I'll be educational and it's, it's kind of almost like, how would I say? It's like Will Smith in the classroom. Oh, sure. You know, like, cause Will Smith, he's not really like that gangster style rapper. But if you, if you took Will Smith and made him an ESL teacher, that would be kind of like my hip hop on the radio. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not hard. I'm not trying to front. I'm not trying to be something that I'm not. I'm just giving the listening audience something entertaining and they can pull something out of it. When I'm on stage, if I'm doing a show, there's no holds barred. Yeah. You can battle, you know, also, I don't know how clean this podcast is. Oh, I, I don't want to say what you want. I don't, I don't, I don't want to <laughs> swear, man. I don't want to swear. I've, I've, I've been pretty good up until now. I don't want to start, you know, you know, saying anything bad, but it's, it's no holds barred. Right. You know, you can talk about anything culture. You can swear. You can, you can paint any kind of picture that you want. And it's just all out there. Mm -hmm. Right. But when you're on the radio, you have to understand that that's a profession. That's, mm -hmm. that's a job that you're being monitored by where people are, are seeing you in a different light. And if you go outside, of that people are going to become disappointed and they're going to have a bad image of who you are mm. so I, I tend to not put that into my radio show are there the same amount of forbidden words in korean as there oh. are in english oh. are they are there more <laughs> i i would say possibly more uh more. koreans have an amazing swearing rolodex like you could thumb through that for days and come up with new words oh. and um when i'm on stage if i'm doing a show like i'll swear in korean mm. and it gets an amazing response from the crowd <laughs> they love it Knocks them dead. oh they love it it is See great oh, breaking yeah. it up. oh yeah oh yeah like and especially if the timing is right like because i'll be you know battling with some Somebody or doing a hip hop rhyme with some Korean kid, and and I'll throw something down, and he'll say something to me, and I'll say it back in the crowd, just like oh, you know, it's it's pretty it's pretty fun. Mm, it's something yeah. you can only see if you come here to Busan, yeah. or you can hear his show on Busan EFM ninety point five. Is does it stream online? Oh, of course, uh, yeah. it can stream online, or for um, all of your listeners who are tuning in through the podcast, uh, if you go to your app uh, Kage, your app store, mm -hmm. and uh, you search B E F M in any applications uh, search engine for either Android or uh, iOS, you can find our app. There are only two BEFM apps out there. The one one is brown, which is not us, and then the other one's like a blue E. Mm. Download that, and you can listen to our show streamed live, and we also have backlogged episodes going from four months back. Mm. So there's an AOD um, button in the app when you download it. Click on AOD, select Midnight Rider, and you can listen to any episode and even download it into your telephone if you're on Android or Android.
Dr. Mac. And a lot of your shows, like Tong Tong Tong, they're on YouTube. Yeah, Tong Tong Tong's on YouTube. Um, if you want to follow me personally, I don't really have a huge following on YouTube because I'm not really, I haven't really started that part of my life yet because I'm so busy. But if you look up Chad Curtin, C H A D K I R T O N, in YouTube, uh, you can find all of my uh, videos and you can follow me as well. Um, and there's there's a lot of stuff out there. I've been speaking here in Busan in the Midnight Rider studio at Busan EFM 90.5 with Chad Curtin, also known as DJ Chad, also known as Fusion when he's on stage. Chad, thanks so much. Thank you very much, sir. This is wonderful. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to all the backers of Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea tour on Kickstarter. Adam Hartzell. Aidan Nullman, Alfred Lee, Andy Cooney, Angus Gordon, Bala Chenupati, Cam Smith, Chin Music Press, Dan Caraselli, Danny, Deborah Smith, Emmett Ferriger, Humberto Grant, Ian Plosker, Ismail Kennessy, Jackie Gast, Jay Chang, Jeffrey Davis, James DeVito, Jonathan Filbert, Josh Paget, Kimberly Hahn, Manvir, Mark Hines, Matthew, Matthew Workman, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Monica Eck, Michael Fransky, MJ Pritchett, Patrick O'Flaherty, Patrick Park, Piers Rippey, Robert Salzberg, Samuel Hansen, Sean Brown, Themistocles Chacrusis, Thomas Unterberger, Timothy Dobbs, and Wayne Wright.